Yes. Okay, fine. Roundtable on the learning language and content through tasks, right? So uh, the organization of the uh, roundtable is going to be as follows. First, a very brief introduction by Roger and myself. Then uh, Fran Lorenzo from the UPO, Universidad Pablo de la Vide, will talk on task-based uh, uh, principles. Then Caro Jacob and uh, Maria Juan Garao from the Universidad de las Islas Baleares uh, will talk for uh, another 15 minutes on tasks and transcultural competence. Then uh, Rick will join us as a discussant, and then we'll take some uh, questions from the audience. I hope we will have time. So briefly, then the general goal of this uh, roundtable will be to explore the interface between content and uh, language integrated learning, CLIL, and task-based uh, language teaching, TBLT, along the lines of uh, what we did in a recent uh, special <coughs> issue published by uh, the journal system. Um, as uh, Lourdes Ortega mentions in, that, uh, in, the, in the afterword of that uh, monograph, there are similarities and differences between uh, CLIL and TBLT. The similarities, of course, are that uh, both uh, TBLT and CLIL pay a lot of attention to meaning. Language and meaning are inseparable then. And in CLIL, meaning is connected to content and subject matter learning, whereas in TBLT, is more uh, goal-oriented uh, learning, right? And of course, teachers and students have to uh, interact and collaborate. And there are differences, and she, sum she summarizes those differences as, you know, in TBLT, TBLT is more like a college level type of movement, so to speak. CLIL is more like school age children. TBLT in an L2 context, uh, CLIL in a foreign language context. Uh, research carried out in TBLT is more like experimental research. She, in that uh, study, or in that forum afterward, she claims that, well, up to now, most of the research carried out in CLIL is uh, descriptive in nature. And then the difference in the uh, stakeholders' uh, uh, position, uh, because in, in TBLT, they want knowledge transfer beyond the classroom. And in CLIL, it's, they're interested in both games in uh, language and content, in, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, in both uh, language and content, uh, to, they want them to be balanced, OK? Uh, Roger, it's your turn. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be so OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Oh, really? Um, so uh, this roundtable will focus on two issues at the interface, uh, interface between CLIL and task-based language teaching. First of all, uh, we're going to hear a talk by Fran Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo about how task-based principles can be used to integrate language and content. And the second one is going to be about how task-based units in combination with um, information and communicative, uh, communication technology, so ICT, can be used to develop transcultural uh, awareness. Now, there is an undeniable growing interest in the concept of tasks, as many of you know, um, which comes from, from a diversity of fields. So we have an interest in tasks from the SLA perspective, the second language acquisition perspective, from foreign language pedagogy, from L2 writing, psychology, and many other uh, fields, and of course, from task-based language teaching itself and CLIL. Um, many tasks have been investigated from a theoretical point of view, from a research point of view, and from pedagogical, with uh, a ped pedagogical or within a pedagogical agenda. Now, the two main agendas we've had so far in task-based language teaching is either a cognitive agenda where basically the concerns have been with how uh, mental processes may be transformed by the design of tasks and how this affects performance and acquisition. This is the work of Long, Ellis, Robinson, and many authors you have probably read. And parallel to it, and I would say that sometimes they don't find each other very much, we have a parallel agenda, which is uh, a social cultural agenda, which is more concerned with context, interaction, and individual, and how these may contribute to learning. Uh, to learning. Now, So what we're going to see today here uh, is two examples of how CLIL can derive pedagogical principles from perspectives um, uh, when teaching CLIL uh, through, tax, uh, through tasks happens. So from the cognitive perspective, we're going to see 
uh, references to the provision of rich and meaningful input, which is a precondition for second language acquisition. Uh, and so how techniques may be applied like input flooding or enhancement or other uh, types of techniques, and this will be in the presentation by Fran Lorenzo. Things like uh, the, um, promoting inductive learning uh, instead of deductive learning and input output feedback cycles, how they take place within a task. Right, and incidental focus on form. This would be the more cognitive concepts, if you want. But we also have the issues of critical awareness, negotiation, uh, reconceptualization, and appropriation of meanings uh, in the social cultural agenda, integration of culture and identity in the learning process, and the idea of promoting uh, collaboration and scaffolding um, in interaction. So, some of the questions we will try to answer with this uh, panel, I hope are, you know, what brings tasks and CLIL together? And what are the differences also? How do we interpret meaning within um, the two perspectives? And uh, these are some questions that maybe we can go back at the end unless other uh, questions come up. Thank you. Okay. Yes. You should have the presentation somewhere. All right, I see. This one. <coughs> All right, I mean. Yes. Yeah. Should be somewhere here, but I can see it on the screen. Can you see Does it appear there? Yeah, you, we can see it there. Oh, wonderful. Yes. So, I'm going to do arrows. Yeah. This one? No. Yes. Yeah. Now it's moving. All right, wonderful. Yep. Yep. Hi, Rick. Good to see you. Hello, Fran. <laughs> well, um, thank you, the organizers, Roger, Pilar. Thank you for coming. Um, <coughs> Well, basically, uh, the, 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 what, what I'm going to explain is uh, it's a project that we carried out in, in the south of Spain, in Andalusia. For, we've been working with uh, content teachers and language teachers for a number of years. And we started entertaining the concept of we have this real challenge, which is to send the message to content teachers that they need to x-ray their history, their mathematics, their science with uh, they have to linguistically x-ray that, that, that content, is it, as it were, right? They had to put on the language glasses. And that which apparently is easy or is commonsensical in a way also, uh, it appears not to be so easy or not so commonsensical. The problem is that when you have mathematics teachers, history teachers, and you have all this, those content teachers and you say, what kind of language are you going to teach? They are in a real they have in a real predicament, they have a real trouble, they don't know how to react. And that's something we can see all around in all the bilingual networks that I, I'm aware of. So uh, basically, the, uh, it, this was the first question that we uh, considered, is that if task base has been successful and has been okay for any EFL context, so dating back to the, as a, as a proper, uh, Com as a real communicative method, and, he, and it, it has worked for EFL, why shouldn't it work for, for content-based or for CLIL or for bilingual settings? Um, I mean, uh, we found, for example, that uh, um, we have this spot, the differences uh, task, right? And on, on the left-hand side of you, you can see a typical EFL situation where students have to spot the differences. You have a fisherman fishing, you have the same fisherman, but there are uh, three fish in one picture, two fish in the other. Yeah, so it's basically a spot on the a spot difference task, right? That is EFL. In close situations, you have spot the differences, but it is the three graces, a topic in a theme in, in in classical art. And students basically what they had to do is to see how those are three graces are different in Renaissance and Baroque art. Um, um, it was the same with um, it 
takes a little bit of a yeah, couple of seconds, right, to, to for the PowerPoint to react. So that's why um, sometimes you have role play. Yes, it's a very well-known task type in in the in the, in the literature of, the, of in task research, task-based research. Uh, in EFL, you can ask students to play the role of a child. Yeah, apparently, has some sort of problem with a cat. A cat on the top of a tree. And you have to bring the cat down. So they have to uh, take you know, th that role and speak as if he or she was the the the, the, the girl or the boy. And in uh, a chemistry lesson uh, or physics, sorry, lesson in in, in a close situation, you have role plays when kids or the learners instead of being uh, uh, a girl or a boy, they are neutrons and protons, right? And they have to play that sort of role. And they have to move around a basket, which is the nucleus of the, of the atom, and then they have to move around. So, so it is the same concept, and apparently it works too for them. Now you may have a different kind of uh, task type, for example, reconstruction text task. Now, again, on the left, you have typical sort of, you have some guy called Bert, who is apparently unknown or known to the learners for some trivial sort of reasons. Um, and you have to reconstruct a test given some sort of prompts or some sort of textual information. On the right-hand side, you have the same uh, kind of exercise, but this time it's about the Cuban crisis, so it is um, a lesson in contemporary history. Um, Again, you, you can also have teacher-fronted tasks in EFL. Now, I, I didn't mention it, but I think it is, uh, I sort of support and I, I consider that the right definition for task is that uh, it's just any meaning-based activity. Yeah, that is basically what the, the, the canonical, if you want, definition of task, right? So a typical EFL task, you have a teacher talking to, to, to the students, presenting some theoretical material, if you want, but uh, in the content class, it can be a different, a diagram presenting a, ke a, a chemical uh, process, right? So <laughs> it works. We had this intuition that it worked, right? And uh, with that we concept, we started a, um, a project, right? It was a demand from the regional, from the local administration there, right? Um, what we can see, and just I will be very brief on this, I don't want to get into the details of how uh, processing skills are different in, in content-based teaching and as opposed to EFL, but uh, it is true and there is some research by in the volume, the system volume, uh, that makes clear there is more meaning uh, negotiation in closed classes than in EFL classes. So apparently there is more effort, there is more uh, meaning and form matching, there is uh, more, if you want, awareness that the right word has to be used so you cannot, you have to use different <coughs> kind of cognitive strategies, yeah, that are not so common in the in EFL. Basically, my personal interpre interpretation of that is that if in content-based uh, teaching we cover more the upper part of the of this square, the C part, yeah? So the information is more, so, sorry, um, in EFL, the information is cognitively, is cognitively less demanding and the context is reduced as opposed to the content-based teaching where there is more embeddedness, the context is clearer and is more cognitively demanded. So perhaps that is the reason why there is a different mental activity and there are different uh, acquisition processes going on. Anyway, so this was the cognitive part, if you want. Um, as I say, um, we had this uh, um, pre-task, task, and post-task sequence, which is again the, the canonical kind of uh, sequence of activities in, in the task-based uh, uh, class. And we, um, this was part of a, of a project, as I said. Um, we had like 20 different content teachers from all around Andalusia, from Almeria, well, all around. They were, they, had, uh, they were prominent teachers and they, they had uh, uh, succeeded definitely in creating materials and they had a, a reputation for being good uh, uh, material developers. So the administration brought them all together and we, had, uh, we, we, we were working with them for a couple of years. So we, provide, we created this, uh, this kind of 
task-based repertoire, right, which is easily accessible now. It's fully accessible for people to, to download their, 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 their lessons if they want. This, um, the concept was, I mean, the, basically the task was they had to produce uh, task-based lessons for clear scenarios for the classes they taught in all different subjects, mathematics, history, music, physical education, all different kind of, uh, of, of courses. Um, just as a way of, uh, just to, 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 to give you a very brief instance, uh, in uh, trigonometry uh, lessons, they had some, uh, as a pre-task, there was some lexical presentation, yeah, so students had to learn the vocabulary before they actually started to work in through problems. Um, then there were the formula, the formula like chunks, were also presented previously as part of the pre-activity, pre the pre-task. And it was only when that uh, stage had been covered and completed, it was, it was then when they started working with those, um, with, a, with, a real pr uh, with the real problems, yeah? So for example, you had a real problem, as, which is the, the, the typical uh, sort of class that, the, it is at this stage where the, the, this lesson would start had it been in Spanish, not in English. So a ship of height, 15 meters, is sighted from a lighthouse. From the top of the lighthouse, the angle of depression to the top of the mast and the base of the ship equal 30 degrees and 45 degrees, respectively. How far is the ship from the, light, from the lighthouse? Um, mm, that is the website, yeah? So in case you want to have a look at that, download all the material that you want. Students, uh, teachers have been doing that for a number of years now, they feel comfortable developing their own materials, and they use it, I guess, less, less often. Anyway, so as a second part of, the, of that project, uh, a colleague of mine, Pat Moore, and uh, myself, who said, okay, what, why don't we sort of go through all those materials, all those lessons, it is more than 130 lessons, and see what kind of pre-tasks, tasks, and post-tasks, these content teachers, they are not language teachers, right? These content teachers have used. Uh, and this is precisely the, 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 the list that we have come up with, right? It is not necessary to see them all, but uh, I think it is important just to uh, emphasize the, 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 the fact that these uh, content teachers were familiar enough with a task-based methodology so as to produce the materials by themselves, right? So they were able to understand and implement brainstorming uh, activities, mind maps. They were capable of modeling target fu functions. Uh, they incorporated note taking as part of their typical sort of activities in chemistry, in mathematics, in history. So that pre-task stage was covered. Then there were the tasks, right? They conducted experiments, simulations, yeah? resolving problems and, pr and presenting solutions, they knew how to, how to do this, and this was less of a problem for them because this is basically what they do, yeah, usually. Um, and um, finally, there was this post-task phase, which was a little bit more of a challenge for them because basically what the message, uh, what, what, we ask is, what we ask them is to uh, control and see what kind of language problems students had, isolate them and leave out like five, 10 minutes like every hour for, the, for them as content teachers to go over and, and um, revise, right? So students could actually notice, yeah? Notice those language features. Um, we were pretty satisfied with the, with the, with the, um, with the project as such. I think, student, I think teachers were also happy that they could understand that they, they, they were able and they had the, this feeling of being totally able for once, right, to, to, to incorporate language in their classes. We could also see that, that there was a lot of potential in this method, not only for second language learning, but also for first language learning. So we started to consider language across the curriculum, including all the languages in the, in the school. And that is basically the the idea I wanted to, say, to, to present here. There are some references. If you want to learn more about the particular tasks, because uh, I imagine you couldn't see the, them all, 
in this brief presentation, but we had a publication in Language mm -hmm. Learning Journal, Pat Moore and myself, in to the, uh, 2015. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, shall we? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, you need to sit over here. Places. Yes. Okay. Was it okay, time wise? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, thank you. In fact, it's better because now we can fit uh, yeah, more, more time into the crowd, <laughs> which is, yes, 13 minutes. Hello there. Do you have another? Yes. I have it here. Wait, do you need the pen back? Yes. Yeah, too. We left it here. Yeah. Somebody took it out of the. No, it's here. It's here. It's here. Oh, okay, we yeah. found it. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Sorry. Just in case. See, now you think I'm okay. Here you go. It's with the arrows. Yeah, we wanted to make it bigger here. Ah, oh, right, you made it before. Did you, did you, you could not see it. It's okay, no, it's okay. It's thinking. Okay. It's slow. It's Friday afternoon. And the thing is, it will cover part of the screen. Okay, is that all right? <laughs> no. Can you see Rick yeah, on, the okay. <laughs> on the corner? <laughs> okay, I think we'll manage. We'll try. <laughs> okay, and now what? This? This one? Or do we need it? Or we just... No. <coughs> Where? I think we need technical help. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's gone. Yeah, no, no, it's it's disappeared. It's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to set him up in the car. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. He's back. <laughs> yes. Okay, it's the arrows. The arrows, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. 
uh, we're getting no started. We've been watching you, but that's that's over now. <laughs> okay. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you, Virgé, for having us. Okay. Uh, well, as you can see, the title of our presentation is in culture, in, Encouraging Transcultural Awareness Through Content and Task-Based based le Lessons. And uh, I'm Maria, and then Karen will get involved as well. Okay, so we'll start with a brief uh, introduction, uh, which uh, then will continue with uh, Karen uh, presenting uh, our project, which is enti entitled The English as an International Language uh, in Poland and Spain Project. Uh, and then we'll draw some conclusions. Okay, so so as to foster the uh, internationalization of the uh, interna of the uh, EFL classroom, uh, we've uh, brought together a series of ingredients. The first of which is content-based, a content-based uh, approach to EFL, uh, which we've combined with uh, uh, task-based learning, and we've done that uh, in order to enhance uh, the use of English as uh, an international language among our learners who are uh, learners in uh, Spain, on the one hand, in, in Majorca in particular, and in Opole, Poland. And uh, in addition to enhancing their English, we also wanted to enhance their transcultural competence. And we've done so uh, by means uh, of uh, an ICT tool, in particular blogging. Right, so um, Lister and Ballinger describe content-based approaches as points on a continuum. Um, and uh, in that continuum, uh, we can see that uh, there are programs which are more on the content-driven side of the continuum and others which are rather on the language-driven side of the continuum. And this is in fact uh, our case as we are, uh, I mean, the, class that, the classes that we are exploring are language classes, EFL classes, but with um, thematic units uh, being worked on. So if you like, they're an example of Klilling. Um, now, um, we worked on those thematic units on the basis of tasks because we felt the, uh, impor the importance or the potential that task-based uh, learning has to foster authentic, collaborative, and interaction-driven language learning. Uh, research has shown that uh, task-based uh, approaches can improve learners' motivation, can, as has been in, in a way hinted at before, uh, can also accelerate uh, language learning, and d while doing that, it can also uh, widen uh, students' uh, cultural perspectives. Um, we are also uh, interested in the processes that are at work when, uh, wh when doing task work, uh, in particular negotiation of meaning and uh, co-construction or reinterpretation of knowledge. Now, um, as, as I've been saying, our main aim is to uh, encourage uh, the use of English in the international arena and of transcultural competence. Uh, in particular, and uh, the thing is that um, uh, with um, EIL uh, coming to the fore, the place of uh, culture in the uh, EFL classroom has uh, been questioned because you know that uh, L2 speakers have uh, quadrupled uh, in the last half century and they are actually uh, surpassing now uh, native speakers and also that these L2 speakers are uh, often learning uh, often learning the language, English, for reasons other than their interest in the culture of a particular English-speaking country. Uh, and so we think uh, that this distinct uh, aims uh, uh, the, that uh, EIL, um, EIL users have may uh, also need particular approaches uh, to uh, teach them. So, um, going to, mm, we're going to have a bit of a problem here <laughs> with Rick. Um, Rick, can we move you down for a minute? <laughs> so, well, I don't you think, I don't know. Like it? Let's see if we can, <laughs> because he's going to cover our <laughs> definitions. Yes, you nicely, can. just for these ones. There you go. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, 
So I was uh, trying to define here what uh, transcultural competence uh, is. Well, first of all, we've used the prefix trans instead of maybe the more commonly used uh, intercultural competence because we feel, uh, following Thompson 2011, that uh, trans captures uh, the uh, a sense of mul multi-directional movement, flow and mixing that uh, we feel responds better to the sort of uh, uh, environment that we are investigating. And also following the uh, researchers that you see on your left-hand side, uh, we have, uh-uh, it won't appear. Now maybe because we are, have a problem here. The white, a white screen. screen. Mm. Now we are in PowerPoint, but the things should appear here and they were appearing before. Is that moving? No, it's not it's moving. No. It's, but it's like... But we can explain it more If, or less. if not, we can if it doesn't it appear, no we'll problem. explain it. It's a pity yeah. because we had animation. Maybe if we can move. Or yes, go. yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, the way we've, um, as I was saying, we've operationalized this uh, concept, or this uh, uh, construct of transcultural competence is through a series of notions, okay, like I said, following the authors on screen, in particular, word learn world learning, which is knowledge of our societies and, and lifestyles, then also uh, global awareness, which implies uh, understanding of transnational conditions affecting uh, people's uh, quality of life. Um, then foreign language proficiency, well, I think we all know what that is. Then uh, effective development, which uh, means developing qualities such as flexibility, sensitivity, open-mindedness, and so on. And uh, empathetic activism. Uh, which is showing an inclination to take action to fight injustice, and it is often connected to critical thinking. Right, so that's uh, what we mean then by cultural competence, and the place where we've brought all of these ingredients together is through the blogging, where, which is the third space, where the uh, two learning communities uh, in Majorca and uh, Spain and, and uh, Poland that we've talked about come together uh, through uh, this uh, virtual space really um, and thanks to computer mediated uh, communication uh, students have the possibility to renegotiate to uh, their, their identity and to also develop a sense of witness, a sense of coming together and uh, bonding. Right, now Moving on, finally, uh, to the specific study, uh, the uh, research question that we set ourselves was, what evidence is there of the emergence of transcultural skills after the implementation of an ELT approach that combines content-based task work with virtual third space communication between culturally diverse English language learners? And then, well, you can see the ingredients that I've been mentioning before, that we have uh, put together in this uh, transcultural approach. Now, our participants were uh, 95 EFL learners uh, aged uh, between the ages of uh, 14 and 16 uh, in two different locations, as mentioned. Uh, and that was part of a case study that was carried out throughout an entire academic year. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in this uh, study, uh, the two groups benefited from a largely parallel transcultural uh, approach with the characteristics I've mentioned. And uh, now Karen is going to take over and describe the way. Okay, uh, good evening. I'm going to start off with just explaining a little bit about the blog that we were using, the blog interface, and then give uh, some information on the different units of work that we we were doing with the students and some of the um, results on the blog. So as you can see here on the screenshot from uh, the interface, uh, the blog was called EIL in Poland and Spain. Um, on the right, uh, if you look down, you'll see that uh, we have some information, pages about the units of work, which were cultural stereotypes, Africa, 
and then the third unit was mu music with a message. You also have a list of all the students who are participating uh, on the right. And then looking at the main part, uh, you can see that there's a, obviously um, a post here by one of the students with some photographs of a pole, uh, and underneath there's comments from other students. If you want to make a comment, then you'll see that in this particular example, there were three comments. You click on that, and all the comments open up. So on the next slide, we can see an example of some comments to one of the posts of the students. Okay, so let's go on to describing a little bit about the work, uh, the units that uh, we did with the students. Um, the first one was called uh, Cultural Stereotypes, and you can see that they were divided into a pre-task, principal task, and then a post-task. All of the units uh, followed this format, and it was generally the post-task that was where the students had to put some work onto the blog so they could discuss things with the students from the other country. So here in this particular example, uh, to start off in the pre-task, the students were given um, pictures of cultural objects pertaining to, to different countries. They had to guess uh, where, using these stereotypes, uh, which country uh, they were depicting. Obviously, they didn't have the names of the countries there on the pictures. Following on from that, their main task was uh, to fill in a worksheet about stereotypes and then have a discussion about that in class. Then, uh, for the blog work, the blog assignment for the post task, they were given two questions which they had to answer on the blog and then discuss comments between themselves. So the first question was, are cultural stereotypes a good way to learn about people from other nations? And the second question, do cultural stereotypes about a country motivate or put you off wanting to visit or learn the language that was spoken in that particular country? So here's one of the replies from one of the Spanish students. He says, I think stereotypes are a way to introduce you in the costumes or customs of one country, but they're not always true. And yes, sometimes they can be harmful because someone can judge and he just uh, know one person of the country, so he has no idea of what he is saying. You'll see here that all quotes are uh, verbatim, so um, you can more or less work out what they're saying. There are some mistakes. But obviously here you can see that this person is learning about the world, so this is one of our areas of transcultural competence, and is also think, starting to think critically about some of the ideas. Right? So the second unit was on Africa, and in this particular unit, the, the principal task for the students was uh, to, to make a, a PowerPoint and give a presentation in front of their cla uh, classmates on one of the countries in Africa or a, a particular topic uh, concerning different countries within the African continent. So uh, they then had to post their PowerPoints on the blog and make comments on all the different PowerPoints from Poland and uh, from Spain. So let's have a look at some of the comments. We've also here taken some comments from essays. For the Spanish students, they also did um, an evaluation essay on the topic, one on the PowerPoints, and the, the teacher gave us the essays. So, in the first one, which is uh, talking about sensitivity to and the, um, and the injustice of some things that happened, uh, this particular student says that people that took advantage of Africans because they were poorer, and then he says, the worst thing is that they were treated as heroes. So here we can see ideas of global awareness, becoming aware of what was happening, world learning as well, the history, and also, again, this critical voice that is coming through. And then we have an example of empathetic activism, uh, where the, the student here um, reflects on what has happened and says, in the future, I want to create my own charitable organization. So here he wants to change the world. <laughs> Carry on. But you know, they are 14, 15 year olds, and it's, it's very good. Okay, in this particular slide, um, one of the students, uh, they did a PowerPoint on genital mutilation, and of course, uh, talking about the awareness of, of cultural practices, which many of them didn't know about this. Um, but what we want to highlight here was this idea of, of sharing um, knowledge between the students, this uh, co-construction of knowledge between them. And so one of the comments was, there is a book Desert Flower, which tells the story of a woman who survived these terrible things. So again, we are sharing information here. Okay. So our last unit was music with a message. Here the students had to work or find out a, find a song that had some sort of message, protest, social message. They had to create an activity for their classmates, uh, a gap-filling activity, and watch the video. Then they had to post the video on the blog as their post task, and uh, they had to give an explanation of the meaning of this song, uh, what the message was, and then obviously talk about it with the other students. 
So again, uh, we've chosen one, one example here, uh, Pink Floyd, money. And here we can see um, this idea of um, critical thinking here. And he says the, the group is protesting about the massive production of money. And then one of the students from Poland uh, comments on this. Well, I never listened to this song, uh, but I know it. The text is about, uh, but now I know it, sorry. It's about human greed and its consequences. So again, uh, this idea of critical thinking, this critical voice coming from the student. We're finishing, okay. And just very quickly, we just also want to mention, obviously, uh, we can see an increase in their proficiency. Uh, word lengthenings, shortenings, um, uh, also corrections, they self-correct them when they've made a mistake, poor women's, poor women, for example, and this is the typical sort of language that um, these students use, this um, informal language, especially um, in CM communication. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and not forgetting humor very, very quickly. Uh, let me just read one. Uh, we are the smartest, the most beautiful in general. We are the best in school. What self-worship. So the humor brought these students together. There was a lot of humorous things, and this brought them all together, these students, this sense of weanness. And as some conclusions, well, we would just like to say that uh, we feel that this use of these specific content and task-based units um, has uh, encouraged the acquisition of transcultural competence in our students. We've seen all of these examples. And that CMC allows these learners to go beyond the, the border, the confines of the classroom, and uh, speak to uh, communicate with users of English as an international language in other countries. So obviously this is a good option uh, to foster learners' authentic use of language as well as this idea of internationalization at home uh, due to the fact that not all students have the luxury of being able to go abroad to, to visit and practice language. And uh, some references and acknowledgements and thank you all for listening to us. I'm sorry for taking so long. <laughs> Now we're going to listen to Rick. I need one minute. Thank you. Okay, Rick. Now I'm going to be showing your image, and I have your presentation too. Would you like me to show the presentation as you speak? Yes, yes, please. Okay. And I will, I will let you know when you can go to the next slide. Great, great. Thank you. Let's hope it works. Yes. <laughs> Don't worry, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> now it's opening it. You can close ours off. I can close this one? Mm. Does it Excellent. work? I, I have your presentation, yes. Fine, great. And you're still on the screen, so I can show you, right? Uh, not showing it. Oh. I think this computer has a problem. Definitely. <laughs> it wasn't us. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's coming up. Uh, now, yes, we are seeing your presentation now. Great. Okay. Whenever you're ready. I think I am. Okay, go ahead. Okay, first of all, thank you to the organization to invite me to, uh, to be virtually present at the ISLA conference at this uh, TBLT uh, workshop. Thank you so much. My name is Rick de Graaf. I'm from Utrecht University. Um, at the moment, I am... Next slide, please. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry, but it's not moving. Yes, that's that. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, great. At the moment, I'm in Zutphen, which is uh, at the, the red dot on the east side of this map, which is about 100 kilometers east of Utrecht, which is right in the middle under the blue dot, which is about 30 kilometers south of Amsterdam. Um, so now you, you understand where I'm connecting from. This might even look like, like the transcultural uh, experience that, that the students had in uh, the, uh, the uh, classroom practice that was just presented. Um, next slide, please. Okay. There you see, this, there you saw what Zutphen looks like along the river, the Eisel. Okay, that's about uh, my context for, from which I am talking to you at the moment. Um, when we talk about CLIL and task-based language teaching, we can focus on similarities and we can focus on differences and we can see where, but more interestingly, how the two can meet. 
um, in the uh, special issue of system from last year, uh, in her discussion uh, contribution, Ortega uh, uh, argued that CLIL and TBLT are based on the tenet that language and meaning are inseparable. That's definitely true, both for CLIL and for TBLT. Um, she indicated that importance is given to meaning. In both cases, language and meaning are inseparable. In CLIL, meaning is connected to content and subject matter learning. In TBLT, CLIL, uh, um, uh, connected to goal-oriented learning. Um, in this definition, I think we can say that also in CLIL, meaning is connected to goal-oriented learning. The goal there is to learn content in subject matter. So it's uh, uh, a, a different focus, but it's in both cases goal-oriented. And in both cases, teachers and students must interact and collaborate in order to reach that goals. Must interact and collaborate in language and through language, and must interact and collaborate on content, in that case, in CLIL, on subject matter content in order to reach that goal. Ortega further says that although in CLIL meaning is connected to content and subject matter learning, whereas in TBLT meaning is associated with experiential and goal-oriented learning. But again, I think in CLIL, where language is used in other subjects, there is also experiential learning and goal-oriented learning. It's the experience of uh, a subject lesson and it's the goal of understanding and learning for that particular subject. Next, please. Okay. So, if we focus on the differences, the differences as were presented also in the introduction of this, uh, of this symposium, um, it could seem like that TBRT is more college level oriented and CLIL is more school age oriented, TBRT more second language context and CLIL more in foreign language context that in TBLT more experimental research is taking place, whereas in CLIL more descriptive research is taking place, and that in TBLT the focus is more on knowledge transfer beyond the classroom to real-life practice, whereas in CLIL the focus is on a, a transfer, a development of language and content for the use in education. But are these really different, relevant differences? May these be surface differences, or are these inherent differences of the different focus of TBLT and CLIL. I would say that here we talk about inherent differences, not so much about the surface differences that are most relevant, because I think there's a difference in perspective between TBLT and CLIL, which on the one hand could mean that um, we are comparing different things, on the other hand, the positive thing is that as they are different perspectives, we can use the one as part of the other. Task-based language teaching, I would say, is a specific pedagogical approach, which aims at faci facilitating language learning through tasks. And in order to do so, a focus on meaning in relevant contexts is necessary. So we have to create relevant contexts in order to be able to focus on the meaning of that context. CLIL, on the other hand, is not in the first place a pedagogical approach, but is in the first place, place a specific organizational approach. It aims at facilitating language learning in subject matter context. So that is the context that is used for language learning. And for that matter, a specific pedagogy is needed, which supports both content learning and language learning. We cannot be happy with language learning only because we, we use, we make use of the subject matter lesson. We make use of content and at the same time, the subject matter learning goals and aims have to be reached. That is, in task-based language teaching, language is a means, um, a means or a tool and a goal at the same time. And content is only used at, as a means, as a tool, in order to reach language goals. Um, in CLIL, both language and content are used as a means, as a tool, and are a goal for learning. 
For that matter, task-based language teaching may be a relevant pedagogy for content and language integrated learning. And CLIL may be a relevant context for TBLT to take place for pedagogical reasons and maybe also from a research perspective. Next, please. Okay, from this introduction, let's focus on the talks by Fran Lorenzo first. Um, Lorenzo presented tasks that were created by content teachers and that were analyzed from a TBLT perspective. And here we could see very clearly that within a CLIL context, TBLT as a pedagogy and as a, 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 a framework for task and task material development can be very useful. We can speak about in-class tasks. So there is a way of um, uh, authentic task use, but the authenticity is not so much in the real world. The authenticity is in the real school world, as it is the kind of activities that usually take place within a subject matter classroom. And that's why those subject matter teachers were able, in a natural way, to create, to develop this kind of tasks. So we speak about authentic classroom communication in these examples. We also speak about authentic subject matter text types in these examples. The type of texts that are relevant in a subject as history, in a subject as biology, etc. And authentic subject matter topics. The, uh, uh, the example of the, uh, uh, the painting with the comparison between the, the three Rubens women and the three uh, women in the other medieval painting, that's relevant for the subject matter of an arts class. And the text of comparison is also relevant for a subject matter arts class. That is, in this kind of classes, in this kind of subject lessons, language is always present for subject matter learning. The question is, how can this presence of language be made more explicit for the pupils and also for the teachers, because we know from other research that content teachers are not always so much aware of the role of language in their teaching. Um, so how can we raise this awareness for teachers and for learners in order to raise uh, the effectiveness of the use of that language, not only for content matter uh, learning, but also for language learning? In TBLT, in this context, in this particular global context, then, uh, uh, Lorenzo has shown that it shares characteristics both at the pre-task level, at the task level, and at the post-task level to make four meaning connections explicit and to make subject-specific text types explicit. In content teacher training, then, I would say, we could focus on how task characteristics at the pre-task, the task and the post-task level can be used in an effective way to both support uh, content matter learning and language learning. And here I think we can use evidence from TBLT research that is also relevant for the context of CLIL. Let's go to the presentation by Karen Jacob and Maria Juan Grau. Um, they presented a very interesting context of transcultural learning in a virtual environment in which pupils from Mallorca and pupils from Poland were in interaction around relevant transcultural topics. They focused on cultural topics, they understood their own and their interlocutors' cultural perspectives, and in that way they were able to develop their cultural development. And language was needed in order to do so. That is, here was definitely authentic communication. Although it took place in a virtual environment, it was communication between people with different contexts and different meanings. So here, really, negotiation for meaning took place. Not only on the meaning of the the, the, the vocabulary, but also on the meaning of different perspectives on cultures. For that same matter, um, 
there was an authentic information gap as pupils from the different countries uh, communicated from their own cultures, um, where uh, an information gap on different perspectives of these cultures had to be bridged. Interestingly also, uh, the communications were not targeted to a, let's say, native speaker language or a native speaker culture. Um, it was really an example of English as an international language, which is relevant for communicating between people from any language or any context. We could say here then that in this example of task-based language teaching, um, negotiation of meaning took place, as this was necessary in order to create understanding, but also negotiation for meaning took place, negotiation in order to understand and to create new context, and also negotiation through meaning took place. There was new meaning, new context created, um, and there new learning took place. Let's go to the next one. I would propose a research and development agenda from this introduction and from these two examples. And I think relevant questions are for the, both for the TBLT research community and for the CLIO research community, the following. What TBLT approaches, so what TBLT specific pedagogy is most beneficial in CLIO contexts, where we do not only focus on Le, uh, the goal of language learning, but where the goal of content learning is also essential. Second, how can tasks optimally make use of the aims and content, contents of subject matter learning? That is, how can we even better make use of what happens in the subject class in order to create optimal conditions for language learning? And how can tasks be an intermediate between the two. Third, what characteristics of CLIO context are applicable for task development in TBLT? If we know about the relevance of the subject matter content in CLIO, how can this be used in order to create even more authentic tasks from a TBLT perspective? As in a classroom setting, tasks from any subject are authentic tasks. Within school, these are the authentic tasks. And then fourth, how can an integrated focus on content development and on knowledge development, as well as on cultural development, enhance the power of TBLT? If TBLT not only focuses on language development with content as a tool, but also on content development, on cognitive development and cultural development, May this be a starting point for even more effective TBLT? What does this mean for the principles of TBLT development? Yeah. Uh, let's go. Let's go to the. Rick, I, I think we will need to start wrapping up because we're already using time of the general. Uh, assembly. That's okay, but the next one is the last one for now. Excellent. Great. Yes, <laughs> because I wanted to go back to the differences that were presented by. Uh, uh, you and Pilar in the introduction, based on uh, the differences by Ortega. Um, and I talk about inherent or surface differences. And I would say then that the differences are actually surface differences. Also in uh, 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 CLIL, we can focus on college level. Also in TBLT, we can focus on school age children. They are both relevant for second language context and for foreign language context. The, the reason that there has been mainly descriptive research in CLIL and experimental research in TBLT is a matter of context, but can also be de could develop to a more integrated uh, type of, of research. And in both cases also, we are interested in transfer beyond the classroom and we are interested in the use of the language that is learned within the school setting. So I think the two can definitely meet. And although we have not uh, met in person during this this uh, discussion, I have been able to meet virtually with you, and I am most interested in your comments and questions over there on the account. Okay, now uh, we don't 
Yeah, I just yeah. Uh, obviously, I would like to you know just give you the floor and um, give you time to ask questions because I'm I'm, I'm sure there will be questions. But uh, uh, we are taking up uh, the time of. But it was not our fault. I have to say that the the plenary in the afternoon was uh, really late, and so that's why we started late, right? And that's why we. So I don't know if we can take two more minutes just to wrap up. Nope. Just one more. Okay, so I guess um, I, I, I guess we have to close here, and uh, we have you have our emails. You can contact us. Uh, we want to finish by thanking um, Anna Linares, who was uh, the person who actually encouraged us to to prepare these. And uh, Roger probably wants to say something about next year. Well, just that uh, the next Tasbeh language teaching conference will take place in Barcelona from the 19th to the 21st of April, and you will all be very welcome uh, yeah. to come where we will discuss these issues, among yeah. others. Th thanks for being here. Thank you thanks. for being here, and thank you, Rick, for your thanks. Thank you, you're welcome.